Okay. We'll, um, we'll start back from where I left off. Uh, let me, um, uh, well, let me real quickly go through what I said in case uh, the, the first version uh, didn't work at all. Um, for the next project, we are building a model. Uh, instead of a regression model where you predict a change, we want you to build a classification model that classifies the certain the current situation of the stock as buy, sell, or do nothing. Um, and of course, we use data, machine learning, and we build that model. Uh, now, uh, here's what our data looks like. And again, these are uh, data frames. Uh, instead of time going down as it usually does, we're going to go left to right. And each one of these planes here represents a particular feature. Uh, so we're going to focus here on uh, technical features, which are features that we compute from uh, volume and uh, um, price. Okay, so any vertical slice through here represents the value of the features on a particular day. Uh, we also have the historical prices, and we use this, of course, to train our system. Now, on the last day, uh, which is here indicated in yellow, that's today. And we're trying to make a forecast or prediction into the future, and that's what our Y is. Now, of course, on this last day, we don't know what the future is, so we can't train on today. We have to go back in time to train our system. So the way we train our system is uh, we go back to some historical time. We look at the value of the features on a particular date. But uh, again, we're, we want to have our I, our Y, represent something in the future. So we're going to look at the change in prices uh, into the future, and that'll help us classify as a buy, sell, or do nothing. So each day in history, we have uh, these X's, and we know what happened into the future. So we can use this pair of X and Y to train our system. So we step forward one day at a time. Um, finally, we reach the last day that we can train on, and that is, uh, it works out to be some number of days uh, before today, because if we're going to look uh, into the future and see what the future prices are, let's say we're looking 10 days into the future, that means the latest data point is 10 days ago. Okay, let me pause for a second see if uh, see if things are working online. Uh, any questions from the online folks? Any questions from the in-person folks? Okay. Now, um, let's uh, let's look at how we would um, actually backtest one of these strategies. So one thing to point out is if you build this model uh, from all this training data and then you go back and you take your model and you test it across that same data, do you expect that it's going to work well or poorly? It will work well, yes. Um, it better, right? I mean, uh, because it's, uh, it, it, it's like getting a copy of the midterm exam three days in advance and then getting the same exam, right? Um, uh, gee, if a stock has these features, and uh, look, 10 days later, it went up 5%. Um, and then you go back, you know, it's like time travel. It's like being able to go back and uh, know that you should have sold all your stocks before the market crash or that you should, you know. Anyways, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of uh, cheating. Um, so uh, we have to take steps to, to prohibit that. So here's what you do. Um, you roll back time. And uh, let's say we rolled it back to this, to the edge, the, essentially the boundary between this blue and white. That's that's our artificial today. Uh, now we're allowed to train our system with all the data before that date, but not any data after that date. So we train our model. We make a forecast. So we're uh, classifying stocks as buys or sells or predicting how much they're going to go up or down. And that forecast is 
let's say, um, five days in the future. Um, remember, we're not allowed to peek and see what really happened there. We're only allowed to use this data um, and then that last day uh, to query our system and make that forecast. Uh, then we enter our orders and trade. An important uh, thing to point out here is you, um, uh, if you're basing your uh, uh, information on market close, uh, you should not trade at market close. You can't, you can't trade until the next, the next day at the earliest. So um, uh, it, it's just not, um, it's not feasible to act on something at the same time you observe it. So keep, uh, keep that in mind when you're, um, when you're building your back tester. Uh, anyways, you trade. Now you have to hold those positions and see what happens over time. Uh, so time advances up to that uh, up to that date that you had made your forecast. And again, you train your system on the available data. Now one question is, uh, how far back can you go? Um, so you know this area over here is in the past still. So yes, you could use that data for training. Uh, but uh, in my experience, it's, it's good to be consistent and just always look back a constant amount of time instead of all the way back over all the data. If you look back over all the data, um, the, the performance of the system gets kind of muddled because it's being trained over different market regimes and so on. Uh, it, it, it's better just to look over more um, recent uh, time periods. Um, okay, so you uh, rebuild your model there, you make another forecast, you uh, trade, uh, and then uh, time goes forward and you see how it works. Um, this method is called roll forward cross-validation. Um, we had talked earlier uh, when we first introduced machine learning about um, cross-validation where we slice the data up into like 10 uh, slices and we would train on nine and test on the 10th and then uh, vary each time which of the 10th pieces we would uh, test on. Remember that? Now the um, important distinction between that and this is you can only test on slices in the future. You can't, uh, you can't like slice up the, the data over the last 10 years and uh, uh, use the last um, nine years for training and 10 years ago for testing. Um, and the reason is uh, it just, uh, the, the way the market behaves in the future is extremely predictive of the way that it was in the past. It's like, I know that sounds weird, but um, uh, it, let, let me try and restate this better. Um, it's easier to predict the past than it is to predict the future. Is that maybe a better way of putting it? Anyways, people are giving me weird looks. But um, uh, the changes in market regimes um, typically are happening uh, in the past and they affect what happens in the future uh, and they're usually irreversible. So it, it, it's extremely easy if you train over data in the future to, ex to do really, really well in the past. And if you do that, it, you just you shouldn't trust your results. Um, you can't trust them. So always, always um, with stock data, you can't do this. Can't do this multifold uh, cross validation. You can only do roll forward uh, cross -valid roll forward uh, cross validation. Okay, I'm gonna. So that's um, basically an overview of uh, what you should do for this next next project, and in general how we. Um, train and test machine learning uh, strategies. Um, I want to talk a little bit um, about ways that back tests can go wrong. Um, it, uh, the, in fact, the name of this talk is um, Nine Ways That Back Tests Lie. Um, and what it sort of comes from is uh, uh, every now and then in this business, you'll run into some young whippersnapper who has some awesome strategy and they'll show you some back test that's fantastic and uh, try to convince you to use it. Um, but if you ask a few simple questions, you usually discover 
that there's something wrong there. And this is, uh, these are sort of the questions you should ask yourself as you build these strategies. Um, so I, I think the, um, the tenth way back test lie is that there's only nine ways or something like that. Um, okay, first way that back test lie is, I just mentioned it, in sample back testing. So you train your model over a few years and then you go back and you test it over that same data. Believe it or not, a lot of it doesn't even occur to people that that's totally bogus. But um, it it should now certainly um, occur to you. Um, uh, and this method is doomed to succeed, right? Um, one thing I do want to mention is for this um, upcoming project, we are actually going to allow you to um, test your uh, test your method in sample. Um, because uh, it's often really, it's, it's almost impossible, you know, with, with the training you've got so far to build a machine learning system that's going to work well in the real market. So we at least want to give you an opportunity to um, uh, work well, you know, back over your training data. Um, but we certainly want you also to test it out of sample so you can see, you can see the difference. Okay, I showed this already and kind of covered it. Um, uh, anyways, the, the general way to avoid this, th there's two parts to it really. Um, so one is, uh, let's suppose you're doing this roll forward cross validation I was talking about, and you, you keep tweaking your techniques and so on, and you, you train from 2007 to uh, 2016, oh, it didn't work well, I think I should use um, linear regression instead of decision trees and do it again. But we should use this factor instead of that one. You do it again. You keep doing it. Now you're you're still doing roll forward cross validation, but you're tweaking your methods each time so that it works better over that time period. You're still in that case a bit subject to uh, this in sample um, fallacy, um, and that is uh, you you know now which features work over that whole time period. You didn't know that back in 2007, but you know that after you did all these tweaking. So uh, a way, an additional um, form of uh, roll forward validation is when you're doing your initial testing, only work over some time period in history. Like, don't go past 2010. Do all the tweaking you want to um, over that period. Find the best model you can. Then let it go forward and see how it works. Um, and that's, uh, that's an important technique. Survivor bias. Um, does anybody know what survivor bias is? Raise your hand. Dave at least knows what it is. Okay. Um, one person in the back. Okay. Um, the official description is it's selective use of data in a statistical study that emphasizes examples that are alive. Um, let, me, let me give you an example. Let's suppose. Um, Let's suppose we're a drug company, and we're going to um, do a test on uh, this, our blood pressure drug. Blood pressure drug. We're going to do a five-year study. We pick 500 people at random, um, and uh, we we measure their blood pressure. We give them this drug, and we measure their blood pressure uh, each month. Um, so the first month, the average uh, blood pressure was 160 over 110, which is high. Um, by the end of the study, our um, average patient now only has um, uh, a blood pressure of 135 over 80. It sounds like our drug is fantastic, right? But what if I were to tell you that um, 58 of those 500 patients died during the study? And what if I further told you it was the ones with the high blood pressure? So at the end of the study, we're only testing the people who lived, right? And in some sense, they're guaranteed to be in better health than the ones that died. Um, so it's a survivor biased um, test. We're, we're only testing the ones who survived. Um, well, it's the same thing if uh, someone tells you, okay, I've, I've uh, invented this great strategy and I've I tested it using the S&P 500. Um, you, gee, there's 500 uh, stocks, it must be a pretty thorough test, right? Well, if you go back um, from 2007 to 
from 2008 to the present, uh, 58 of the members of the S&P 500 are gone. They, uh, they died in 2008, 2009. So uh, if you work with the S&P 500 as of today, it means you're only working with stocks that survived through the market downturn. Um, let me show you, um, let me show you essentially what this means. Uh, let's say this black line represents the performance of the S&P 500 um, overall, and you see that big drawdown in 2008, 2009. Well, uh, if we're using the members of the S&P 500 today, each, each, one of, each one of these is a you know, green line showing what it did over that time. Uh, you know, they all did reasonably well. Um, but we're not counting those that, uh, those that died. We're obviously biased uh, uh, to the positive side. In fact, here's an example. Um, what, um, uh, what the purple line represents is the um, performance of the S&P 500 over time according to which stocks were actually in the S&P 500 at that time. The green line is the performance of a portfolio that is using the S&P 500 as of today. Um, and there's about a 13% difference over that time. What that means is if you were to run a study using as your universe of stocks, the current membership of the S&P 500, you've got a built-in 13% advantage. Um, so some you know, young whippersnapper shows you this fantastic strategy that outperforms the S&P 500 by 13%. Um, and you ask them, well, what's your universe? And they say the S&P 500 as of today. You're cheap. Yeah. When, um, if you're investing in the, the SPY ETF, for example, would the SPY replicate something similar to the green line where it just keeps the stocks? No, um, uh, SPY um, is the purple line, essentially. Um, because uh, uh, it, it, it was, in, you know, in 2009, it was constructed of the stocks that were in the S&P 500 in, in 2009. Um, the green line is uh, the current membership of the of SPY, but going back um, with those same stocks uh, historically. Any questions online? No? Okay. Oh, okay, how to prevent. So um, uh, one thing to mention is uh, in your data that you got for this class, uh, you, have, um, uh, you have the membership of S&P 500 as of 2008 plus membership of the S&P 500 as of 2012. Uh, so if you want to do uh, a survivor bias free type back test, uh, you have the list of stocks that existed in 2008 and 2012. Um, so you have some data that you can do that with now. Um, if you were going to go, um, you know, work at uh, Citadel or some big hedge fund, uh, they pay for that data and they have it. Uh, my company, Lucena, has it. Um, essentially what we have is for a number of major indexes, we have on every day in history which stocks made up that index. And so if we're building a strategy based on, say, the Russell 3000, uh, we go back to whatever date we're starting our back test. We say, OK, who was in the, S the Russell 3000 on this day? We get that list of stocks. We use that to select what we might trade. And then we step forward. And we do that every day to see which stocks we could use. Was there a question over here? OK. I'm going to skip. Um, uh, this one is important. Um, it turns out that uh, even if you were, um, and I'm going um, to do just one more and then hand it over to uh, Dave. Um, but uh, anyways, even if your system is predictive, uh, in other words, uh, you just you sit calmly back, you make a prediction, and watch what happens to the price, but you don't act on it. You just uh, make predictions uh, and see what happens. 
It turns out that you can have a system that is predictive, that it accurately predicts changes in price, but when you act on it, the very act of engaging the market with that information uh, uh, causes the price to go against you enough that you essentially nullify that informational advantage. Um, let me tell you how we um, how I dis how I discovered it. Um, it. I was working at a hedge fund out in California, and uh, um, you know, throwing machine learning, building a model, trying to get something going, and uh, we found something that worked. In fact, it, 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 in back tests, it, it had this abs it had an absurd sharp ratio of seven. It really had a sharp ratio of seven. Um, and my boss said, no way, that is bullshit. There's no way that that works. Anytime someone shows you a sharp ratio of seven, that's what you should say too, okay? Um, and I said, no, no, look, look. And, and anyways, I convinced him, so this is what it, uh, this is what it looked like historically. And uh, this, this time right here is um, where we were in time. It was in uh, 2009. Um, and uh, anyways, I convinced him it looked good enough that we started trading it. So we traded a um, uh, million dollars uh, against this strategy. Um, and uh, then it did this. So it was going just horizontal. Didn't make money anymore. It was a long, short strategy. Anyways, then he said, I told you. Um, and I was like, ah. So we spent um, weeks overhauling the code. I mean, we, we were certain that um, somehow in our code we had managed to peek into the future a little bit, and that's why we had this sharp ratio of seven. Um, and that, of course, when you start live trading, you can't peek into the future, um, and so that's why the, the advantage evaporated. Um, but anyways, we, uh, we stopped trading, and we overhauled the code, made sure there was nothing wrong, and indeed, there was nothing wrong with the code. And uh, after we stopped trading, it did this. Um, uh, why? Well, um, it, uh, it, it, it turned out when we um, dug down deep to, to figure out what had happened, um, so we, you know, going forward, indeed, we were able to predict the prices of these stocks. Um, uh, and the difference over about a week um, uh, or the, the, the amount that um, the sorts of changes we were predicting were on the order of about uh, 20 dips or um, uh, 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 0.2% change. Uh, well, it turns out that um, depending on how actively traded a stock is, um, you can affect the price more than that. So we discovered that we were the, the stocks we were discovering were very thinly traded stocks. So there were stocks that maybe for a whole day only had like $50,000 worth of um, trades, and we were like trading $10,000 worth of it. Um, so we were 20% we were, uh, of the volume of a particular stock. And we were affecting it so much um, that, uh, uh, yeah, we, we were predicting what would happen without us being in the market, but we were crushing the price. And remember, we had to exit the position too. So it, we would crush it like 12 bips when we bought it, and then crush it 12 bips when we sold it. So we were losing 24 bips, but we only had a prediction advantage of 20 bips. So we we're destined to slowly lose money. Uh, yeah? Uh, suppose that this prediction was not for thinly traded stock. And uh, you managed to trade a smaller amount than would affect. I mean, that would perceptively affect the market. Would it work? Um, yeah. So let me repeat the question for um, those who can hear. Uh, uh, I think what you said is, um, well, what if you just traded less? Um, yes. Um, so probably it would work. So um, here, um, here are a couple observations about this. Uh, uh, why? Essentially, what we discovered is some market inefficiency. Um, in other words, uh, we found some information that, uh, according to well, according to the efficient markets hypothesis, um, that information should immediately affect the stock price. Um, but we found some places where it didn't. Um, well, why was that? Well, 
Um, so but again, these stocks were only trading maybe $50,000 a day. Well, suppose you are a $20 billion hedge fund, um, Citadel, uh, as an example. Um, it's not even worth your while to consider a stock like that because you can't you can't buy $20 million worth of a $1 million stock. You'll just totally obliterate the, 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 the price. So the reason there is still those inefficiencies there is because the big hedge funds haven't pointed their guns at it. Um, they don't care, it's not worth it for them. But uh, yeah, potentially um, a bunch of uh, um, young whippersnappers in their garage, uh, if, they, if they find 500 stocks that are thinly traded and they buy $100 of each one, uh, yeah. But eventually, uh, every strategy has a capacity, right? So this strategy might really work great until they've got $2 million in it instead of 500,000, and then eventually the, um, the advantage evaporates. Um, okay, those are, um, those are the main points I wanted to cover. Um, I wanted to hand it over to um, Dave now, who's going to talk about um, uh, uh, how to operationalize some uh, some technical strategies. But yeah, we'll answer questions first. Yeah. Are there any legality restrictions for uh, doing trades that 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 can change the market's price? Um, are there any um, legality aspects that? Uh, I'm just repeating a question. Um, where you make trades that might may affect the price. So um, uh, there are. It's not well defined. Um, there, there, so so just buying a stock and and impacting the price because you buy it is sort of a legitimate thing. Uh, but there are a lot of folks uh, who will do the following. They will um, they'll put a big order. You know they've got a co-located machine. They'll put a big order in uh, so that everybody sees it in the order book, uh, but they take it out um, uh, within a few milliseconds. So say you're in California and uh, Dave and I are here in New York. I put this big order in. Uh, he advertises it, so you see it in California, but I take it out. Um, and by that time, you've seen it in California and say, oh, I, I like that. And you enter a trade, but by the time it gets here to New York, it's gone. But you've revealed yourself to me. I know you would have bought it at that price. Um, so I can then exploit that information. That might be legal in the future. It's currently not illegal. But uh, that, that's something uh, people are getting agitated about. Any online questions? OK. Dave, come on down. Um, Okay, so it was uh, Dave. I was um, not turning on the full screen. Just uh, uh, if you can make that work, I have a lot of detailed code that will probably be hard to read. Okay, um, I don't know. What I think happens is when I go to full screen, they see the um, the. Well, I can. Are you streaming now? Okay, let's see what happens. Um, I'll tell you what, um, why don't you get started and then uh, I'll advise you what's happening. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's what happens. Okay. okay. I don't know how to not do that. Well, do you prefer that? Well, I think so because then at least the people in the room can read it, and the okay. folks online can probably zoom in better than people here can zoom in their eyes. Okay. Okay. I'm much taller than you. So Tucker asked me to uh, do a little bit of a vectorization tutorial today that is specifically targeted at the next assignment that we'll do in the class. Um, I did not actually solve the next assignment. What I did was I solved an old version of the next assignment. 
So the assignment is a trading strategy. You have to create a custom technical indicator, which means any information time series that you can create from just price and volume information. And then use that technical indicator to create a custom trading strategy that you will then back test through time and evaluate its performance. You don't have to write the back test yourself. You will create an orders file out of this assignment. And that orders file will be in the format of the market simulator that you already wrote. So you can leverage that market simulator to do the actual evaluation of how well your strategy did. So the specific approach was um, the requirements, like I said, create a technical indicator, create a trading strategy based on it, and then given any date range and symbol set, and our auto grader could do that to you, give you anything at all. Um, we may not actually auto grade it, but it should be able to run anything. You need to generate an orders file of what your strategy would do for that time period for those symbols. So what I chose in order to make it complicated and difficult to vectorize, because I'm a masochist, is I decided to do a basket indicator, meaning I was going to take several technical indicators and make a decision on them together as to whether or not I should buy or sell stock. So the purpose of the basket indicator I chose will be one that looks for a divergence between a stock and the stock market. So divergence-based strategies are basically when you try to find two things that normally move together. Most stocks go up when the market goes up, down when the market goes down. That's your beta from the cap in model. But sometimes among stocks that typically do that, they will suddenly break from the market and either go up while the market goes down or down while the market goes up. And that can be an interesting event to try to track that lets you know that something you might care about is happening. So the constituent indicators I'm using for my custom indicator are the price to SMA ratio, which is exactly what it sounds like. You know how to calculate the SMA. It's just the last N days added up and then divided by however many days. Um, the price to SMA ratio will just be today's price divided by that period SMA. So it's effectively a ratio where one means today we're right at the SMA. Greater than one means we're above it. Less than one means we're below it. I'm also using the Bollinger Bands percent. You've seen Bollinger Bands earlier in the course. You know that Bollinger Bands involve tracking the SMA as the central line of the bands, the SMA plus two standard deviations of the same rolling period as the upper line, and the SMA minus two standard deviations as the lower line. And that's typically used to trade when you cross back into the bands after being outside of them. Here, I'm taking that one step further and turning it into a percentage of how far am I from the bottom band to the top band. So the bottom band will be 0%, the top band will be 100%. And that will let me get it as a single indicator that I can use. And finally, the relative strength index. This is a different type of oscillating indicator. It's called an oscillator because it attempts to predict when the market or the stock you're watching is reaching a high or a low, rather than being a momentum indicator that tells you which direction it's trending. So relative strength is very easy to explain. It is a ratio of on days this stock goes up, how much does it go up? Divided by on days the stock goes down, how much does it go down? You can see where that would be useful because if you just looked at the number of up days versus the number of down days, you might find the stock goes up and down relatively equally often. And you might think, well, there's no trade here. There's nothing I can do with that. But if you found out that when it goes up, it goes up twice as much as it goes down when it goes down, you might do something with that information. So the relative strength index normalizes that to a zero to 100 scale, where below 30 is typically interpreted as meaning that the stock is oversold or unfairly punished and may soon go up again. And above 70 means that it's overbought or unfairly rewarded and it may soon go down. This is an example of what those indicators look like on a chart from stockcharts.com, which is one that I sometimes use. The bottom area is showing the RSI, and the little green-filled areas are identifying regions where the indicator says that Google stock was overbought or oversold at that time. And of course, you already know what the Bollinger Bands look like. So the basic strategy I'm wrapping around this is I want my strategy to go long whenever the stock I'm looking at appears to be oversold or maybe unfairly punished. But the index is not oversold. 
So it looks like this stock has gone down more than might be reasonable relative to the market in a short period of time, and I could perhaps expect a reversion to the mean. Conversely, if the symbol is overbought and the index is not, then I'll go short and I'll close any positions whenever the price crosses through the moving average. So I've completed a reversion to the mean and I'm not sure what's going to happen next. I'll close out. And I won't read all of this at you, but basically I want to be a little bit outside of the upper or lower Bollinger Bands to make a decision. I want to be substantially above or below the price to SMA ratio. And then I mentioned the RSI. I don't claim that this is a great strategy. This is just one I thought would be complex enough to implement the assignment, be interesting, and do some vectorization. So I initially wrote it as iterative, uh, iterative code, which is how I think, it's how a lot of people think, either that or recursion. Vectorization is not natural to most people that started as sort of normal software engineers or normal programmers. If you come from a math background, it probably is very natural to you, and you're very lucky that you've chosen to do machine learning. Um, so fully iteratively, very quickly, um, all we need to do to calculate SMA is just create an array that is the same size and shape as our daily price array. The copy function is not as bad as you think it is, by the way. Pandas does not copy indexes, and it does not copy values when you issue a copy command. You might ask, what does it copy then? And the answer is it copies pointers and it updates them when the values diverge in the data frame from the source data frame. So we copy it, we clear it out, we have a blank correctly sized SMA array that looks just like the price array, and then I simply loop over all the days, loop over all the symbols, but I have to have a third nested loop to loop over the look back period every single day, add up all the prices in that look back period, and then take the average to get my SMA time series. So triple nested loop, not great. Um, when you do the, when you set it equal to zero, that then actually causes all the pointers to change. Yes. Yeah, that updates all the pointers. Um, because basically, it's pointing at a new data space, but it doesn't do the internal magic until it diverges from the old space. Um, I was surprised. It actually turns out to be faster to use copy than to create a new zero filled array. That seems weird. Okay, same idea for Bollinger Bands. Um, since I'm not vectorizing anything, I have to loop over all the days, loop over all the symbols, and then loop over the look back period. I've already calculated SMA, so at least I can use that part. And then on that fifth line, you can see for each day, I calculate the Bollinger Band by um, taking the standard, I'm uh, calculating standard deviation. So it's the price on that day minus the price of the SMA squared, and I'm accumulating those square differences as normal for standard deviation. Then once I finish looking over the look back period, I can just complete the calculation by getting the bottom band as my SMA, plus two times the standard deviation, top band the other way around, and then I can do my percentage just by normalizing that from zero to 100. All of this code, by the way, is in the sticky post at the top of Piazza. So you can not only see this explanation again, but you can get like every version of the code from iterative and then every change I made all the way through. After I do the Bollinger Bands, I don't need that raw SMA anymore. Now what I need is my SMA price ratio that I wanted. So I can simply run through and for every day, replace the SMA with the price for that day, divided by the SMA for that day. And now my SMA array is the price to SMA ratio indicator that I want. The last one, relative strength, is very straightforward. Um, loop over all the days, loop over all the symbols, loop over the look back period. Here, what I need to know is I have to look at each day in the look back period and the day before it to see if the price went up or down between those two days. If the price went up, then the following day was an up day, and I need to accumulate it into my up days variable. If it was a down day, then I need to separately accumulate it into my down days variable because I'm looking for the average of how much it went up on days it went up and vice versa for down days. Then once I have all that at the end, I can take the ratio of up and down and normalize it according to the RSI formula. This one actually turns out to be really hard to vectorize. Finally, 
I'll only look at the first part of this, but this is the iterative code to apply the indicators and actually make our trading decision. So again, we look through all the days, all the symbols, but now we want to use the indicators we calculated to make a decision. So this line right here is the first trading decision. And this is all of the times that I want to go long. So for each day, I'm saying if this day, this stock, the price to estimate ratio is below 0.95, which means I'm trading well below my moving average. And my Bollinger Band percent is below zero, meaning I'm outside the bottom band. So I'm like way down. And my RSI is below 30, which means the RSI indicator is showing that I'm in an oversold range and may soon turn upwards. And the index is not oversold, which means I have my divergence that I want. Then, if I'm not already holding the stock long, I'll output an order to buy the stock on this day. I do the opposite for selling short on the next line, and then my two close conditions are simply, again, I have to look at two days back to back. If yesterday I was on one side of the SMA and today I'm on the other side of the SMA, that means I cross over. And so if I was holding the stock, then I do the appropriate order to zero out my holdings and go back to nothing. Now, that works perfectly. But it took five and a half minutes to run on my Core i7 quad processor in my pretty new MacBook Pro. Five and a half minutes doesn't seem that bad for stock trading, but consider I'm looking over seven years of data. A lot of times people want to do much more than that. I'm only looking at seven stocks. A lot of times you'd like to at least consider the entire S&P 500 for trading, maybe the entire Russell 3000. I'm using three indicators. A lot of times people will use a basket of indicators that numbers 10, 20, 50. And I'm only looking back over 14 days. You might want to do 28. You might want to do a 60 day look back period. Given that I'm doing all of these order in the square triple loops, if I start inflating all of those numbers like that, I may not live until I see my answers. So I need to get that five and a half minutes down on this toy problem so that I have room to scale up if I do a really serious problem. So we're gonna go through multiple steps of vectorizing, and this is the actual order in which it occurred to me to vectorize it one step at a time, not being a person who's really great at vectorizing. The way that I always approach this and the way I recommend you do it if it's not natural for you is get the code working iteratively. No matter how long it takes, just make it work, get the right answers, and then keep a copy of your output. And one step at a time, try to replace each loop with vectorized code and then diff it against the output from your iterative code and make sure your output never changes. And if you do that at every single step as you're going through trying to vectorize the code, then you'll always know immediately if something didn't work or changed the values, you'll be able to correct it before you build up some huge snowball of incorrect results. So the first things that obviously occurred to me were I should get rid of the triple loop, at least, the innermost loop, for the two simple indicators, the SMA and the Bollinger Bands. And that turns out to be extremely easy, right? So where here I was looping through the look back period, 14 days, and for each day I was individually accumulating the price into the SMA variable. Clearly I don't have to do that. I can just define a range that is that 14 day period for that symbol, and then do a sum in a single step. That's obvious. On the Bollinger Bands, the same thing. Instead of looping through the 14 days, calculating it over and over again, I can just take the difference that I wanted between the price and the SMA, go ahead and square it, and accumulate that sum as a single step here. So this has reduced my calculation by more than you might appreciate, because if you think about what I was doing in the SMA, I'm calculating, I'm using the price for each day as part of 14 separate calculations. Because on day 14, I'm adding up day 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, up to 14. On day 15, I'm adding the same prices I just did for 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, up through 15. So every day, 13 of my 14 calculations are redundant, and I already did them, but I'm doing them again. Uh, and so given that, it should be no surprise that just making those two simple, simple, simple changes 
got me from five and a half minutes down to a minute and 50 seconds, which is 66% faster just for changing like two lines of code. So even if you can't figure out how to fully vectorize everything, still pick off those low hanging fruit and you'll probably see dramatic improvement just from your first couple of iterations. The next thing that was obvious to do is anytime I'm zeroing out an array, it was foolish just for example, to go through fully iteratively and clear out each index one at a time. Clearly I can do that vectorized. You all know how to do that. Now I can go back and try to eliminate the second for loop in the SMA. Why am I looping over all of the symbols when I could just as easily define a range for the symbols and do that all at once? That doesn't need too much explanation either. I just take the look back period as a range and here I had symbol before, now I'm doing them all at once. Now that I have more than one symbol, I need to make sure I sum across the correct axis so that I'm summing across the days. I don't want to sum across the symbols or I'll end up going the wrong way. And then divide that by the look back to get my SMA all in one shot. Again, one simple change, 35% faster than the previous step. So we're making progress very rapidly on speeding this up. Now I can go ahead and get rid of the last loop with the SMA, the outer loop and just do the whole thing as a single simple vector operation. This strategy comes up again later. You might think, well, if you've got a 14 day look back period, how do you define a range to iterate over all of the days and calculate a value, but then somehow within that also iterate over each subset of 14 days? And of course the answer is you can't do that just as a simple range substring inside an array. But if you think a little bit indirectly, and you'll do this a lot, you'll come up with a way that you could get one set of numbers where you could do a simple range. And in this case, what occurred to me is to use the cumulative sum. Because what is a 14-day sliding sum across a time period other than if you did the cumulative sum for all days and then subtract today with the value from 14 days ago, Everything is going to be the same except for those 14 days in between. So if I just cum sum the whole thing and then take today and subtract 14 days ago, that's exactly the same as doing that rolling sum. So now that I've done the cum sum, I can calculate everything in one step just like I wanted to by simply subtracting everything from 14 days before to get the difference, which was my sum of the 14 days, divided by the look back. And I've manually calculated my rolling window now. Obviously, if you don't want to go through that, there are built-in pandas functions for this that you can see below. But that felt like cheating, given that I was trying to show how to vectorize things. OK, we can do the exact same thing for the Bollinger Bands loop. The Bollinger Bands loop is just iterating through the days, the stocks, and the look back period, and using the SMA I already had, hand calculating the standard deviation, and using that to get the upper and lower Bollinger Bands. I don't need to do all of that. I can use the pandas price rolling function with standard deviation to calculate my rolling standard deviation in one step. I already have my rolling SMA that I calculated myself. And now as vector math, I can just say, well, the whole top band of the Bollinger Bands for my entire date range is just the whole SMA plus two times the whole rolling standard deviation and the opposite for the bottom band. So now with a vector top band and a vector bottom band, I can calculate the whole Bollinger Band percent series in one step by just subtracting the prices from the bottom band get down to my zero, and then see how far from the top end that is. Vectorizing the SMA to price SMA calculation is trivial. I'm going to talk about it. Um, the hard part, RSI. RSI was really hard to vectorize on purpose. I kind of hated myself for picking it. So the first thing you do in RSI in the inner, inner, inner loop is you calculate the delta between each day and the previous day to see if it was an up day or a down day. Clearly, that's the same as calculating daily returns. So I can simply pre-calculate my daily returns, and then I don't have to do all that delta stuff. 
The pre-calculation happens before the first loop. There's like 10 different ways to do daily returns. You know at least three of them, but you just want to subtract every day from the day before and then store that as your vector. Just vectorizing that instead of calculating those deltas every single time through the loop, sped it up by another 46% and we're now down to 38 seconds. Okay, now I can tackle that inner RSI loop. So the innermost loop is the one that's handling the look back period. Instead of dealing with the look back period individually, what I would like is I'd like to say for a whole 14 day look back period, how can I in one step get a sum of all the up days and a sum of all the down days separately? I can't do that with daily rests and I can't do it with a slice because I don't know which days are which. This is where you get into the real power of NumPy. The fact that you can approach it like a database and give it a where clause. And that where clause can contain any Boolean that refers to an array of the same size as the one that you're slicing. So in this case, I can get all my up gains at once by saying, here's a slice of the look back period but I only want the elements where that element is greater than or equal to zero, and then sum those. This Boolean array keeps the indexes, so I get zeros for all the days where the condition wasn't true, so it doesn't impact my sum. So with this one statement, I get the up gain total for all up days in the period, and the down loss total for all the days in and then I can use those to do my calculation, and I've saved myself another 60% of time. But I don't have to stay with just that either. Now I can eliminate the other inner loop and say, why am I looking at all the symbols one at a time? I've already pre-calculated everything. I just need to use it. So instead of looping through the symbols and then indexing into up gain, I can just take the whole vertical vector for the uh, symbols and calculate RSI as one step across all symbols. You've done that a lot of times yourself. An important note here, it's easy to track yourself with vectorization. Um, I lost one of my checks. I used to have an if that said, hey, I've got a special case where I'm going to divide by zero and that'll be really bad, so don't do that. I can't do that if I'm vectorizing all the math and just doing it in one step. But they anticipated this when they created NumPy. So NumPy does not explode if you divide by zero. In its default behavior, it will actually assign the special NumPy.infinity value to the result of dividing by zero, because that's what the limit would approach. So that means I can go back afterwards and fix this just by doing the division and then say, okay, now everything that was infinity, fix that up to the value it was supposed to be if the down days were zero. All right, the last major code to add. I've got to add code now because it's really hard to eliminate the very last loop of RSI because I need to know ahead of time one vector for all of the up day sum and all of the down day sum. So that means I need to pre-calculate all this stuff. So at the very beginning of my code, I'm going to take that daily rest again and I'm going to get all days where daily rest was greater than or equal to zero. So that masks out only my up days. I'm going to fill all of the NA values with zero to make sure it doesn't destroy my sum. And then I'm going to cum sum. And the same thing for the down days. So on a given day now, my value is the sum of this day and every up day that came before it. And now we can use the same trick I used before. Now to get the sum of the updates in any window, I can just take the cumulative sum at the end and the cumulative sum at the beginning and subtract them. And I get the sum of just the days in the window. So that trick will come in handy over and over and over again. Cum sum can get you basically just one simple subtraction to get back a sliding window without having to do all that looping. Having those up reds and down reds, then I just do what I said. That's these lines where I offset and subtract. And now on each day, I've got up gain is the value of the 14 previous days updates, and down loss is the value of the 14 previous days losses. And then I can finish fully vectorizing RSI. So now that I've got all that calculated, 
I can do the relative strength for all days at once, for all symbols at once, just by saying take that whole up gain array and divide it by the look back, divided by that whole down loss array, divided by the look back, and I get everything all at one time. And that's 40% faster it is. Final thing, the trading strategy. This was also kind of obnoxious because I made complicated decisions with four conditions. So the first problem is I have an orders list that I'm just throwing things into. Clearly, if it's a Python list that starts out empty, I can't vectorize figuring out what's in it. So I'm going to have to go to an orders array that's the same size and shape as my price array and everything else. Then, in order to be able to fully vectorize this, I want everything to be the same size and shape. So I'm going to take my index RSI that I use for my decisions and broadcast that out into a full-sized array that's the same size as my prices. The last problem I face is I don't have an indicator for crossovers. But remember, my closes say when I cross over the SMA, I need to do something. So I have to make that last indicator that I need. That actually turns out to be really simple. So I create a zero set array of the same size as everything else. And then I set only the days where the SMA is above one to one. So now my array is zero when I'm below the SMA and one when I'm above the SMA. Then I can just do a diff on that array, which is a built-in vectorized operation that subtracts every day from the day before it. If you think about what happens after that, on days where I was below before and I'm still below, it'll be 0 minus 0 is 0. Days where I was above and stayed above, 1 minus 1 is 1. Days where I crossed up, I'll have a 1. And days where I crossed down, I'll have a minus 1. So with just a couple of lines of code, I've now got this perfect cross indicator that tells me only days when I crossed over and which direction. And then I can use a compound Boolean index to do my entire trading strategy all at once. Single ampersand and a single pipe let you do and and or inside a Boolean index. This only works because all these arrays are the same size. Please remember that. But now I can say I want orders where SMA is this, and BBP is this, and RSI is this, and SPY is that. And I will get back a mask array only where all those things are true. And then I set my target share position to 100 or minus 100, depending on whether I want to be long or short. And on days where I want to get out of the market, I set it to zero. Note I've done target shares. I could not think of a way to directly calculate orders. This is what I want my holdings to be. But then I can do a forward fill of all my NAMs, because those were days where I had no opinion. So forward filling NAMs now just repeats the previous value to say, well, I want to have the same number I had yesterday if it wasn't a day where I was supposed to take action. And then again, I can do one more diff. And taking your target holdings for every day and running a diff over it exactly gives you an orders array. Because if you have the same holdings as yesterday, that means no change, no order. If you have more holdings than yesterday, you need to buy something. If you have less holdings than yesterday, you need to sell something. And then finally, there's no way to vectorize writing to disk a custom CSV file that you just made up the contents and it's not necessarily clean. But I can delete my index column. I can delete all of the days that have no orders. And that reduces by 90% the number of rows I have to look through. And indeed, I get one more 90% savings. So my final output which is exactly the same as what I started with, is now a thousand times faster than where I began, going from 5 minutes, 24 seconds, to 0.35 seconds, and producing the identical logic with the identical output in all cases. So please find the code for this online. I think there's, you'll see iterative.py, and then there's like a step A through step J, where you can get the full, complete code that you can run yourself every single step see what I did, and see how it works. And there's also a Piazza thread you can comment on, and I'll be happy to answer questions about it. Thank you. You can, uh, um, yeah, thanks, Dave. That was great. Uh, we can take one question in case anybody has one. OK, everybody wants to get out of here. OK, yeah. uh, we will collect at the back of the room in case uh, you want to ask us a question later on. And uh, any question online?
Yes, but I'm not sure I understand. Okay, I'll, I'll just answer it on the piazza. Um, thanks, everybody. That was exactly the right time to talk about. <laughs>